back to the What The Fork Sunderland Preview Podcast. Sunderland followed up two huge league wins with a bit of a meh performance, shall we say, against Mansfield Town as they exited the FA Cup in the first round on Saturday. Though we have got Fleetwood Town in the Pizza Hut prize trophy, whatever it's called these days, on Tuesday night, all attention is pretty much correctly diverted towards our home game against MK Dons this coming Saturday. And to chat MK Dons and Saturday's game is Liam from the MK1 podcast. Liam, how are you doing? Are you all right? Yeah, not too bad, thank you. How about yourself? Yeah, not too bad. Just feeling a bit meh about the entire season, if I'm honest. How, how are you doing with it? Yeah, a bit of meh myself. Um, I said we'll get into it, but we're kind of putting in the performances for not getting the wins as such. So, uh, yeah, a bit frustrating. I think we're the opposite way, San Saturday. We're not putting in the performances, but we're getting the occasional wins. But <laughs> no one can quite decide which one they want more. For me, three points is always the most important. Um, but we'll get straight to it. Russell Martin, been in charge of MK for a year now. And although the majority of it has probably been eaten up by the COVID situation, how are MK fans viewing Russell Martin's first year in charge? Yeah, it's been really positive, actually. Um, you know, previously we had um, Robbie Nelson and Tisdale as managers who didn't really get the association with the fans. Um, but with managers like Carl Robinson in the past and obviously as now Russell Martin, they get it, essentially. Um, it's a nice way of putting it. And we've always been this club that really wants to get behind the team and be that 12th man as, you know, our stadium gets a lot of stick for atmosphere and things like that. Um yeah, it's really positive. We're playing decent football this season. Um, and as you mentioned in the intro, but unfortunately, we're just not getting the results at the moment. Uh, but all we can hope is that it's going to come eventually and Russ Martin's going to be rewarded for his uh, positive thinking and total football, essentially. I was going to say, he seems to have totally changed the style from Tisday last year. I remember, I, I cannot remember who I was speaking to, but I think it was someone who had been watching MK for a little bit and seen the transition. And, and Russell Martin literally looks like he's came straight from the, the Norwich City style of thinking. He keeps you keeping the ball on the floor where Tisdale was maybe a bit more, maybe not direct, but well, yeah, maybe direct, yeah. Yeah, well, it's funny, you know, because from when, it, when Martin first came in, he went to the um, 4 one 2 one 2 diamond. And we kind of thought that would be what would happen this season. But he's actually referred to Tisdale's formation of a 3 5 2 or a 5 2 whichever you want to call it. Um, and yeah, we've, we're not called the possession champions of Europe for nothing, you know. Um, <laughs> I think we average like 65% possession in our games, which is ridiculous. Um, but yeah, it's enjoyable to watch. It's just frustrating that, you know, the results aren't matching up with that. And on the podcast, we've kind of been talking about the past few weeks. It feels like we're sort of going for a cycle of saying the same things. Yeah, and I think it can get like that a little bit, can't it, sometimes? But with Russell Martin, I suppose... I remember when he first took charge and from an outsider looking in, it felt a little bit like, oh, they've appointed the coach. Well, that's not going to change anything. But yet it, it did, didn't it, really? Yeah, um, I know our, our fan base is quite critical. Um, they always have been quite a demanding fan base. And um, yeah, a lot of people made it with, um, you know, a lot of criticism. But I think they have to remember that, you know, when Carl Roberts first came in, it was a very similar situation. Um, you know, he wasn't a, a player as such, but he came from, you know, being an assistant manager and, you know, Martin was actually a good appointment because he was a player in Tisdale's playing squad. So he understood, you know, what players we had, what we could do. And, you know, now he's starting to mould his own team. And yes, it may not be going as quick as we want it to happen, but it's going well and we're putting in the right building blocks to creating that really good team who can push higher at the table, like Sunderland are at the moment. <laughs> so far so far yeah so far yeah <laughs> um when it comes to that because obviously we play a very similar formation with the three at the back and we sort of play that where our two full backs are almost like uh, sorry our two center offs on the right and the left hand side almost work like your full backs and then your wing backs are more like your wingers but then revert yeah. to a five is he doing like a similar style of play is that what we can expect from mk yeah i mean um well, it's, you're lucky actually because um our two predominant win-backs are Daniel Harvey and Regan Poor, both in international duty. So they're both going to miss the game against Sunderland. Um, but typically, yes, uh, we'd have you know, Harvey would tend, on the left wing-back would tend to be the guy who put deliveries in, you know, more of the crossing guy, he's a bit more direct, whereas uh, Regan Poor, our right wing-back, would be the guy who makes the overlapping runs, try and you know catch the opposition off guard. Um, but yeah, it's pretty much that. And with a player like Lewington at left centre-back, he... Uh, He's actually been one of the better playmakers this season, which is a bit of a surprise to us, but it's paid off so far and he's um, leading the league in like, possession stats and key passes and things like that. So, yeah, it's working uh, for now. But, um, yeah, it'll be interesting to see 
with both teams playing the same system, how it's going to work out. Yeah, absolutely. I've got to draw on your, your most recent game, and a lot of Sunderland fans will, will shriek when they hear the word Eastley because of the association with our Stuart. Um, but a nil-nil yes. draw with Eastley at the weekend, uh, a game you did end up eventually winning on penalties. But And I'm just looking at this on paper, I haven't watched any highlights, so I'm seeing nil-nil draw against a non-league team, one on penalties. That doesn't sound too great, said the guy who got beat off Mansfield on Saturday. Um, but how would you sum up Saturday's performance? Yeah, it was um, it was very similar to our previous two games against Northampton, AFC Wimbledon. Um, it was just you know having loads of the ball, creating a lot of chances, um, and just not taking them. Um, like the Easter game, the second half especially, it took us about six to six five minutes to get into the game properly, and then you know we have all the shots in the world, testing the keeper, and it's not putting our chances away. And um, you know it took us what I think I was like thirteen corners, a ridiculous amount of shots. And yeah, we, we, well, I don't want to say we scraped through, but we, Lee Nichols is one of the best uh, keeps in the league in terms of uh, shots stopping. And we had him in goal and he won us to tie essentially. And um, very fortunate. And uh, we're fortunate again to have another non league team in round two in Barnet who uh, play a pretty positive style of football to the uh, same as Eastleigh. To be completely honest, I don't know what the round two of the FA Cup looks like since now Sunderland uh, tend to get knocked out yeah. in the, the first round these days. Well, this is, our, yeah, this is our first time in the first round in like three or four years anyway. So, yeah, it's a change to say the least. We're getting used to it here at Sunderland, unfortunately. <laughs> but um, one thing I did want to talk about was, and I, I can only really draw on maybe the Poirier years with Sunderland. And when we had Poirier, it was a lot of Sunderland fans listening will remember he, he did play that possession-based football. And, and, and you know, what actually really worked at the start. He got us to a cup final and stuff like that. But um, we, we lost 8-0 at Southampton, which I think many people will remember in and outside of Sunderland. And for some reason, we went to a possession-based game where basically our back four would just pass it to each other a lot of the time. And I was looking at your, your stats for the games against Northampton, which was 0-0, and AFC Wimbledon, which was obviously 1-1. And I noticed that there was only one shot on target. Are MK Dons potentially falling into a trap of maybe just not just having a shot and keeping the ball instead? Is, is there a possibility of that being the case? Yeah, um, definitely. I, I'd say majority of the time it's it's like you know um, the previous years with Arsenal, how Arsenal used to try and pass it into the goal. Yeah, it's 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 looking very similar to that in terms of you know it take as I said it's taken us sixty minutes, seventy minutes to actually get into a game and try and go for it. I, I, I don't really understand why. Um, I understand, you know, you, you've got the best chance of scoring if you're playing it down the wings and, you know, putting in low balls for our strikers who aren't particularly that good in the air, um, you know, to tap it in. But it does, as you're right, it just gets to a point where you're like, just have a shot. And, you know, we saw against Eastley on Sunday, I know you didn't watch any of the game, but we were having shots from respective um, plays in the field. And, you know, we were close to scoring quite a few of them. We probably should have scored at least two of them. So, it's, it's about being less conservative and just going for games. And we've, we've been screaming for that for at least a month now. And uh, it's going to get to a point where we're going to need to just go for these games. And hopefully uh, this Saturday is going to be one of those games. Looking at obviously your last five performances, which I think is always probably a half decent market to look at of, of current form. And I think the form in the league especially looks, shall we say, wishy-washy. Um, one win, two draws, two defeats, I think, if I'm right. Um I actually tipped you a lot to be quite safe in mid-table this season, which, if anyone knows me, I'm terrible at predictions. Um, 11 games in your 19th. Is that where MK Don's fans expected them to be? Or are you a little bit disappointed? Um, well, I think if you had asked us before we saw Reese Healy, then yes, 100%. Um, but I think once that sale went through and we didn't, well, we haven't really seen it, his are quote unquote replacements. You can't really replace someone at Reese Healy, but players who were brought in to, you know, occupy him leaving haven't really lived up to what they were uh, signed to do essentially. Um I went on I was on another podcast earlier in the season and the PO4 podcast, the Pompey one. Ah thank you. Yes. Yeah, you. yeah. And I kind of said um, you know, anything other than relegation would be a success this season, just because the quality isn't there up top, or we haven't seen that yet. Um, and, you know, a month or two down the line, it's still exactly the same. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, it's disappointing. And obviously the fan base, are, some of them are even marting out, which is ridiculous. Um, but, yeah, I, I'd say it's where, we should, where we're expected to be. We're a lower league, uh, lower, lower league one sort of team in the 
in my why I see it. And uh, unless he signs and plays in January, I don't think that'll change. But you did lose two obviously big players, and, and you know, admittedly, I think me myself, despite the fact we've been in this division for two years, sometimes as a Sunderland fan, I can have sort of tunnel vision and forget that anything outside of Sunderland doesn't exist. And um, to, to coin a popular phrase from another Sunderland podcast, I sometimes look at other teams as having players that are just men, essentially. Um, but you lost two good players. Obviously, I, I did pay quite a bit of interest thinking that you would drastically fail when Russell Martin took charge, but you, you didn't. And I think, obviously, Reese Healy's a huge loss. He went to Toulouse, which was yes. odd. Um, what did you make of the sale to like Toulouse? Um, well, I mean, the, the, well, some of us fans maybe thought it was due to salary cap uh, sort of restrictions mm-hmm. over here. Um, you know, obviously France doesn't have that, so he can get paid a bumper wage, which re- was reportedly three or four times what he's on here. And of course, you know, get to play in the south of France. You know, it's the worst place to play in the world. Um, so yeah, I mean, the move made sense for him. It was just frustrating how the club dealt with it. And um, I think we're all, even though. We've kind of forgiven them. We're still a bit annoyed about the whole situation. You also lost them, um, obviously, Alex Gilby as well, who's obviously another really, really important player. Um, someone who I actually rated really highly. But have you managed, because you, you've brought in big name players, obviously Cameron Jerome's there at the moment, which is a name that many fans yeah. will recognise. But have you realistically replaced either of those players? I think with the sky, the sky, the signing of Scott Fraser, um, yeah, we have. Um, you know, we were kind of wondering, like, OK, we've sold Alex and we've let go of Reese. you know, who's coming in? And once we heard the name Scott Fraser, we instantly like, piqued our interest because we know what Scott's done at his level for Burton Albion. And, and, you know, the fact we managed to get him over potential championship clubs uh, was quite a coup. I'm sure there was a lot of money involved, but, you know, it, it's been worth it so far. Pretty sure it's our top goal scorer in all competitions um, from midfield as well, which does it all, really. Um, but, yeah, I feel we have replaced Alex and... I've so we haven't replaced Reese yet, prior to my previous comments, but um, yeah, I mean, it's difficult. It's difficult to replace a player like Reese, really. I was going to ask about Scott Fraser. That was actually the next question I came on to because many, many, many Sunderland fans wanted him at the club, and I think there was a, a big rumor going round at the time. It was um, the guy's name completely escapes me. The left back, but anyway, it doesn't matter. Um, there was a left back and obviously Scott Fraser were linked to come to Sunderland and then the salary cap thing came in and all of a sudden it all sort of fell down. And I think a lot of people thought, oh, well, Scott Fraser is going to end up in the championship because there's no salary cap there and so on and so forth. And then with all due respect, he ended up with MK Dons and we were like, yeah. eh? So give us a bit of insight into how you managed to nab him ahead of like championship clubs and, and higher end, maybe league one clubs, if I can call something that. <laughs> <laughs> Um, well, I think the left back might have been Luke Garbutt. It was Luke Garbutt. Yeah, no, you're yeah. 100% correct. Yeah. Um, yeah, but back to Fraser, um, I do think, you know, the club aren't going to say this, but I do think money had a lot of, of like, pull on the deal. But I think he quite enjoyed the style of football that Martin was putting forward to him. Um, and, you know, it's clearly got him involved a lot in scoring goals and being that guy um, with his, I think, three goals in, was it four goals? Four goals in 10 games now. Um, but yeah, and, you know, Ultimately, with the club the way it is at the moment, I think you can either treat it as a stepping stone, as bad as that sounds, to maybe get a championship move a season or two after he scored more goals and more assists. So, yeah, I think it's a combination of the style of football, him excelling in this system, but also, you know, him getting a pretty decent chunk of money and in a team where he essentially is the man of the squad. Yeah, I suppose when you put it that way, when you've got someone saying, do you want to pass the ball or would Phil Parkins, would you like 40 yard Phil Parkinson balls fired <laughs> directly over your head? I suppose it makes a little bit more sense, but I've got to be honest. I mean, I'm, I'm someone who lives in Scotland. Obviously he's played in Scotland. Um, I don't know a great deal about him. His he, he, statistics look good. And, and yeah. sometimes that's what you go with at, at this level because you don't really necessarily hear about players until they've surpassed this level if they're really good. But what kind of a player is he? Um, well, at the moment, he's a great hub for the team. Um, you know, he's one of the few players that's willing to actually drive at the box, um, which we've been screaming for, especially in this 3 5 2, where you kind of need that midfielder who's actually going to push on and put pressure on. Um, and, you know, he's on majority set pieces, on penalties. So, you know, everything that we do as a creative hub goes through him. And, um, you know, as I kind of read off the stats earlier, um, he is kind of the, the centre of everything we do going forward. So it's not a very really fair way to put it. 
No, oh, yeah, I mean that that's kind of how he was sold, I suppose, to to Sunderland fans when we were linked. That he was probably that fast, creative player with a bit of power in the middle that we've been crying yeah. out for since the David Moyes years, to be completely honest. <laughs> but um, it would be very Sunderland to miss out on him. So he's he's hit the ground running. Then he's nothing nothing where we can say, oh, thank God we didn't sign him. Unfortunately for oh, us, he's hit the ground running. Yeah, player of the year so far easily. Yeah, I, I was hoping you weren't going to say that. Really, but, um. Another move that really, really, really intrigued me. Obviously, I mentioned Cameron Jerome before. Scott Fraser had a, a vested interest because of the Sunderland situation. Um, but the big one for me that really kind of made me go, oh, okay, was was Richard Keogh. Mm. And not so much because I, I highly rate him as a player. Um, I actually probably don't. But I think it was a controversial departure from Derby. Uh, I think anyone who's got Twitter seen that his knee was hanging off after that car crash. Um uh, I think potentially unfairly trapped by Derby in the way that he was maybe made a scapegoat and that made the, the situation more controversial. But I was actually just surprised that he came back to be able to play football. Has he looked like the Richard Keogh that played in the championship two years ago? Or does he look maybe that that knee injury has affected him quite badly? I mean, to be completely honest, I didn't really watch much of Richard Keogh at Derby. Um, but the one I've seen in Milton Keynes Dons is brilliant. Um, I know it's obviously a lower level and... He's got a different role in this team. Um, but in terms of what he's done from the youngsters in the squad to basically giving us a defence in terms of organisation and keeping clean sheets is phenomenal. And to get him on a free transfer, when I believe there's other clubs in for him, hiring, hiring this division, I think Ipswich was one of the key ones, and perhaps in the Championship too, is as much as a keeper's phrase it was, to be honest. Um, yeah, he's been phenomenal. And I think he was actually doing a job for the, in the coaching um, yesterday because we had some of our coaches of, uh, on in self-isolation because of COVID. Um, so, yeah, he's, he's brilliant. I know what I'd say about him, really. Do you think that maybe, you know, the situation with Russell Martin being a coach, then being like a manager, and, and, you know, as you said before, Robinson, assistant towards manager, do you think that sometimes brings players that maybe, I don't want to say coming to the near the end of their career, because I think Richard Keogh's 34 at this level, he's probably still got a, a while in him. But do you think that kind of helps that at MK Dons, you've got certain players that could go there, play the last few years of their career, build up their coaching badges and potentially have a shot at a, a good job at a, a League One club? Yeah, potentially. Um, if that's the right they want to do, then yeah, sure. I mean, there, there was talk of, um, obviously, Livington's not a player that's come in, but, um, you know, he, there has been talks of him potentially going on the coaching route and obviously he would probably do it here because he's been here his, you know, his whole career. Um, but yeah, like, you know, I play like Cam, players like Cameron Jordan have come in. Um, obviously, I don't know what his intentions are after football, but there's a good chance we wouldn't have got him if Russ Martin wasn't manager and, um yeah, if, if he did want to do that, I'm sure Russ would happily let him, uh, you know, pursue that. Yeah, yeah. No, it just it kind of it kind of triggered just as we were speaking there that maybe that's yeah. a, a place where it would maybe beneficially help you with bringing players in and stuff like that. I, I don't know, but um, there's something I, I need to come on to, and you probably get this on every single podcast <laughs> that you ever go on to, but, and you're probably sick of people asking it, but I suppose it is of interest to to people outside of MK Dons especially. Now, I went MK Dons last year, and I must be honest, I love the ground, I love the day. We did win the last 10 minutes with an absolute screamer, so it kind of helped the day. But I actually liked the setup. It was a bit weird being at TGI Fridays and also at the match. That was all a bit yeah, odd. Yeah. Um, but MK Dons are a club that many fans attack. And you, you can probably understand why, understandably so. But just to be in the eyes of balance and, and fairness, I wanted to maybe understand what it was like from... I mean, I'm, are you from Milton Keynes originally? Um, so when the merge happened, I yeah, I was living in the local area, but I now live up in Leicestershire. But Got obviously you. I still go to the games, you know, home and away. So yeah. Got you. So Milton Keynes, obviously a great place. I've liked it when I've been there. I think a lot of people like living there. Never really had a football club. So they get a football club. Yep, it is, as many people will see, stolen from someone else. But I want to look at it from a different perspective because everyone can understand it from the Wimbledon perspective, no problem. What was it like to be a fan of a club where maybe other supporters roundly dislike you before they've even listened to your, your viewpoint? Um, yeah, I mean, you know, the majority of people I interact with don't instantly attack me when I say I support Milwaukee's Dons. Obviously, you know, it gets a few like, oh, okay. And you're like, oh, nice. Because I suppose the more casual fan doesn't really understand the whole move. Um and, you know, obviously there was a story today regarding AFC Wimbledon, you know, trying to get the FA Cup badges on their shirts. And, uh, you know, I know um, Milton Keynes Dons fans that was a point Wimbledon FC 
um, before the merge and obviously came with the club to Milton Keynes. So, you know, as much as I like to numb down my views of the whole situation, just because of, you know, for the podcast and my own personal, you know, just enjoyment of football. I don't want to be attacked every weekend for support, for what support my local team. Um, but yeah, I, I know I, I do say that Milton Keith Dons are this test we're going to see just because of the people that I know and what, you know, they're, they're the people I speak to every weekend, um, how they sort of talk about the situation. And um, yeah, it's, it's always difficult to talk about. And, um, you know, they're, as soon as they're back at Plough Lane now, well, back in the quiet, I mean, they're not actually back there, but yeah, I, I don't know. I find it hard to talk about. A yeah. so I think it's, it's always an awkward situation. Like I know we'll never go onto an AC Wooden podcast and they'll never come onto ours. And uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm kind of hoping that now they're quote unquote back at Plough, Plough Lane, that they'll, um, you know, never down a bit, but I don't see that happening personally. I imagine you just want to get past it. Well, that's the thing. Like, I mean, I've gone to the majority of the trips to AS Wimbledon when they were playing at um, the Kingstonian ground or Chelsea FC women's ground. And, you know, going there, it was like going to the way day in Europe or something. It was ridiculous. Like, I know on our first trips there, we were on like, we had to get like, police called by the bus. And um, there was literally like being bricks thrown and things like that. And I think it was a window smashed in the back of the bus. And um, luckily, I don't think anyone got really injured. Um, but it was ridiculous. And the last time we went there, um, I think maybe stupidly, but Russ Martin decided to go through the main entrance to the um, sort of stadium with his family. I was, I was surrounded by AC Wimbledon supporters and he got heckles of abuse. And um, I remember he referred to it in his interview when we played him at home a few weeks ago. And uh, he started taking too kindly to that situation. So, uh, yeah, it's, it's also be hostility. But for me, I don't get involved in it for one. You know, people can fight a battle for us. Um, and, you know, I think the club are very much the same. And it's a shame to see that for the people that were following with the FC, because, you know, they have really vocal views about that. And this always gets brought up whenever we play them. And But it's if the club aren't doing anything about it, then what can we do? You know, it's not accepting it, but it's, it's just kind of numbing it down a bit, I suppose. There's going to be a lot of fans as well coming through, I would imagine, you know, kids who are of maybe 15, 16 years old. Yeah. Well, that level, the club will have always been there and always existed. They will probably not understand where the animosities came from and they'd have to be taught about that. But to them, that would be their, their local club and, and you would naturally tell them to go and support their local club. So do you think in time it'll just like fall away because MK Don fans will not really, they'll probably just understand where they came from, but it'll just be going to support their local club essentially. I mean, well, it's a thing like, um, you know, at my age, we were 18, 24. Um, so I'm, I'm 23 now. And, you know, I was, what, what, five or six when the merge happened? So I didn't know about a win with an SC and the merge and everything. I just support my local team and I still do that now. And, um, yeah, I mean, the thing is, though, like, even if, you know, new generations come through, they're always going to pass on that story of how are the, you know, the phoenix rose through the ashes and all that. Um, and it, 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 I think um, it will go on for quite a while. Um, but yeah, the hope is the hope is that it'll calm down a bit, and it has over the past five years, to be fair. But I think that's a lot. Of, a lot has a lot has gone into that with you know AC Wimbledon, um, you know, quote unquote getting that stadium back, which they didn't, by the way. Um, and then you know them getting the same league as us and things like that. Yeah, of course. What what is because obviously a lot of people have an opinion on the chairman because of what happened. But what is the chairman yeah. like from a perspective of? You know, does he bring in the right recruitment? Has he got things in place? Has he got good ambitions for the club? Yeah, so, um, I mean, I've heard more things about Pete Wimpleman. And um, first, of, first of all, he's a businessman. Um, yeah. You know, that's, that comes over everything. You know, he doesn't get the snooker there in the darts there for no reason. You know, he wants to generate money. And he's, and with the sales of, like, um, Healy and Gilby were ultimately a business move. You know, he's trying to keep the club alive in difficult times that we're in now. Um, and that, that they, weren't, they weren't sold because they got a decent offers, of, in my opinion. They were sold because they wanted to get essentially get a coronavirus plan. Um, but yeah, I've I've heard multiple things. I can't say too much because I don't want to... Um, <laughs> get you yourself know. in trouble. <laughs> yeah, but I, I've been told like, he's, got, he's got good intentions, but ultimately the club would be excel if 
he potentially moved on. Yeah. Um, and I know there's been offers from like Red Bull to, you know, come and take over and, you know, essentially get to that level like they have with Leipzig and uh, people, clubs like that, which I'm sure will go down well if that happened, especially <laughs> as we are the franchise already. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, he's a good guy. He's just very demanding and, um, you know, Every game we see him at the games, home and away, he's basically one of us. Um, he's expecting of us performing as much as we are. And that's nice to see. And it's nice to have that sort of chairman as opposed to other chairmen who don't supposedly care as much as he does. Yeah, no, I can understand that. Absolutely. I suppose it's just one of those chairmen that people outside of the situation, as we'll refer to it as, don't really, no one really knows much about him and what he does. Or, or maybe I'm naive, I don't know. But um, when it comes to, to MK Don's players, and some them players, obviously looking through the list, the, the first name you come to is Will Grigg, is obviously the person that you remember that played for both. And yeah. it's actually a player that's not playing on, um, well, Will Grigg probably won't play on Saturday, but another player that won't be playing because of international duty on Saturday is actually Tom Flanagan, who was also MK Dons. Um, so before we go on to Will Grigg, because I have a feeling we might have slightly different opinions on what he's like <laughs> as a player, how did you find Tom Flanagan? Um, it's weird because I, I did a piece um for another Sunderland website last year and they asked me about Tom Flanagan and I always kind of felt he was never the player that could step up to like a Sunderland and be that type of person and that's kind of pretty evident he's never had that um you know commanding sort of presence at the back I suppose and uh it was always Carl Fadson when he was in the squad he was that guy and um you know who basically led the team um, so yeah, I was surprised when he got the move and um, I'm surprised he's still there. I'm guessing he's on a pretty decent chunk of money, so that might be why. Um, don't quote me on that. But um... <laughs> Flano is a... He can have a great game and then he can make a real howler. Um, is he a confidence player, do you reckon, still? I think so. But I, I like him because the one thing I'll give Flano is if there's ever any aggro on the pitch or anyone ever disrespects any of our players, he's the first one to get involved with it. And I kind of respect yeah. that at this level. I don't know why, but um, <laughs> I think uh, someone told me at, at MK he was called Screech, which I quite like. I, I oh, yeah, Screech, funny. yeah. <laughs> it's a nickname that should catch on with our fan base if anyone's listening. Um, <laughs> but Will Gregg is obviously a really different situation. Like, I think... Um, I've tossed and turned on Will Griggs' form at Sunderland. Ultimately, we've spent a lot of money and it hasn't worked out. Whichever way you look at it, is that manager's fault, previous manager's fault, or Will Griggs' fault? Either way, it hasn't worked out. But he did great at MK Dons. Um, so I suppose that the question I would ask is, how do you get the best out of Will Grigg, in your opinion? Well, when we play, I've had Grigg under Carl Robinson, it was always very much give the feeding in the ball. Um, you know, he wasn't this guy who was going to run through 10 players and, you know, score a screamer. He was always the box in the box type of player, um, you know, tap-ins, um, was being aware, attacking positioning, things like that. Um, so you've really got to create a system around him. Um, and obviously, when he was at Milky's Island, that was a long time ago. And I can't believe he didn't spend a million pounds to buy him, quite frankly, in the championship. It was, the form he was on was an absolute bargain. Um, but, for whatever reason we didn't um so yeah i'd say the, the way to get in grig firing is to build a system around him and it's difficult to do that when you've got players like charlie wyke and danny gray and players like that who you know ultimately are probably more prolific and more experienced at this level and higher levels um but yeah i don't know if you actually heard but i'm pretty sure we came in for world Grig in the summer i i have heard rumors of this yeah Fill me in, because I heard rumours um, of this. So, yeah, there was the cha- our chairman and um, our executive were bigging up this record bid that was put on our player. And we thought it was some guy up in Scotland, but apparently that wasn't true. Um, and then it came out after the window that I think it was Will Grigg. So we must have submitted a, like a, quite a substantial bid for Will Grigg, and it must have got rejected by Sunderland. Um, and just, to, just our record bid was for Kieran Angle, which is about 250, 350k. So it would have been in excess of that, essentially. But oh, yeah, for whatever reason, they got, they got rejected. So, uh, yeah. Well, like, apparently it's worth four million if you watch Netflix. So. Wow, well, yeah, four million. <laughs> well, I don't think that's in our budget. <laughs> yeah, maybe not an hour, actually, come to think of it. Um, <laughs> on to, so back to your players, actually, here. Yeah. I suppose for la- last year, the player that I actually was quite impressed with, and I can't seem to see him anyway, you'll maybe film the same, was um, Sam Ndombe, I think he was called. Oh, it's Ndombe, yeah. Um, where's he disappeared to? 
So he's decided to join Luton Town on loan with an option to buy. So he's jumped up the division. Yeah, um, I don't know why. Um, I think apparently Luton came in for him in January, um, and then you know apparently Sam wanted to join then, but Rush must said must must have like you know gave him a few words and said you know stick it out, um, and if they're back in summer then we'll let you go. And I think it was deadline day they came in in the end. Um, so yeah, I mean I don't think. I mean, I don't think he had a chance in championship. I don't think he's played too much. Um, but, yeah, it's an interesting one. Um, and to be honest, the games we saw him this season, he wasn't great. He probably should have had two or three, two or three tap-ins that were rather good saves where he should have scored. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I mean, if we get... I'm sure Luton will buy him because it'll be a low buyout clause because of, I think he's pretty sure his contract's aspiring anyway. Um, so, yeah, good luck to him. But he's not an NP on player anymore. Not for now, anyway. Which, which players should someone be watching out for on, on Saturday then? Uh, okay, so aside from uh, Scott Fraser, um, I'd probably say Louis Thompson. Um, so he, he's been sort of mixing in between the 10 and the 8 in terms of where he's been playing in the midfield. And um, alongside Fraser, he those two are kind of like the driving force in the midfield, trying to get the ball forward. Um, and Thompson's positioning is quite impressive in terms of how he manages to draw fouls you know the Portsmouth game for example um believe he drew the penalty for that game and actually put in a pretty good performance so I feel he's going to be that type of player who's going to try and get on the heels of the Sunderland players and um try and create mistakes and capitalize on those and uh yeah try and be a pest essentially in terms of the next question this is always my favorite question because it brings up the most sometimes hilarious Sometimes surprising replies ever, but Sunderland are allegedly one of the stronger teams in the division. I think that's kind of a debate, if I'm honest with you, but which players concern you from Sunderland um, in terms of where can we exploit you and which players do you think, I hope they're not playing? Um, I mean, the one player that I was, I've always been quite impressive is Lyndon Gooch. Um, he's been someone that I've always liked in terms of creativity and his He's not one-dimensional, essentially. You know, he can play on the wing and centre. Um, so I feel like he could be quite a key player. Um, I know a lot of people have said Charlie White in the past, I'm sure. Um, but, you know, it's, <laughs> the striker is obviously a player you're going to be worried about. Um, but, yeah, for me, it's more those players that can drift into gaps like Gooch and um, maybe even 09, actually, uh, as a wing-back. He, he seems to be quite a good player who can get those key passes and, you know, try and find gaps in our defence, which can push quite high at times. And, you know, want, I say... I think the game for Sunday is going to be, you know, looking out for our mistakes, which are going to happen if we're going to dominate possession like we want to. Um, and, you know, try and hit us on the counter. And uh, players like a Nine and Gooch, who can either find that key pass or, you know, find space, are going to try and do that, in my opinion. Yeah, I think many Sunderland fans would agree with you on that. Sometimes two years ago, it was a case of uh, which one are you worried about? And it was just Aidan McGeady, so it was pointless asking the question. <laughs> yeah. um, but sometimes you get some slightly better answers these days. So just to finish off then, obviously the final question is always, I'm horrendous with my predictions, but I'll go for it anyway. <laughs> I'll take a 2-1 a Sunderland, I think, because we're, we're at home if there's such a thing these days. Um, but what's your predictions for Saturday? Um, yeah, so I don't think we've ever beaten Sunderland. Uh Either home or away. Um, no, nope, don't think so. So I, I want to say a win, but um, it'd be a pretty unrealistic. So no, I think it would be. I think any result going to Sunderland would be a good point for us. So uh, I'll go one-one. Yeah, you know what? I think that would probably cause an implosion with Phil Parkins and our <laughs> comments. But um, that that is the world we live in. But Liam, thanks very much for popping on. And um, before I do let you go, where can we catch your podcast and, and personal pages and stuff like that? Uh, yes, so the podcast is at MK1 Podcast. Uh, you know, we do weekly Milton Keynes Don's uh, news and we'll have our Sunderland preview up on Thursday morning. Um, and yeah, personally, it's just, it's at underscore Liam Connolly if you want to follow me on that. Perfect. Um, as always, if people have enjoyed me ranting on and, and chatting to people, you can like, subscribe. You can't dislike it, which is probably a benefit, <laughs> but if you want to like it and subscribe and rate, you certainly can. Um, but Liam, thanks so much for popping on, mate. Really appreciate it. Um no luck hopefully on Saturday for you lot um, as I'm sure you you. appreciate it yep. no <laughs> I want it back of course mate but good luck for the rest of the season and thanks so much for coming on no worries thank you very much Stop, man. <laughs>